Good morning. How y'all doing? <laughs> My name is Bisky, and I'm the newest member of the Crossing Church. Very excited to be doing announcements today. <clears throat> Here at the Crossing, we have three important links. You might call them a trinity of sorts. <laughs> I'm sorry. Please forgive me. <laughs> the first link is Crossing Connect. This is our online digital connection card. Fill it out with as much as you're comfortable with and let us know you're here. If you have any prayer requests or needs to share, this is the best place to do it. Second, we have Cross and Give. This links you to our secure giving hub. We have a lot of exciting things we are going to be giving toward and Pastor Kendall is going to tell you all about those in just a minute. You can also go to our website, thecrossingchurch.org and click Give. It'll bring you to the same spot. Finally, we have Crossing Central, our only com online community hub. Here you'll find out information on things we have going on at the Cross and Church, such as our Christmas Eve bonfire this Thursday at 6 o'clock p.m. at the Grove. Now, if Zach did his job right, the address will be somewhere on the screen here. Anyway, thank you for joining us today, and in the spirit of the season, let me wish you Feliz Navidad! <laughs> Happy Holidays! Happy Holidays! Good morning, and welcome to the Crossing Church Online, and Merry Christmas. I'm so excited you can join us here today online for this Christmas season. God has been working in this whole month, even though it's been weird with COVID, uh, but he is at work. In fact, I bet if you looked back on the last year, as we get close to ending up 2020, uh, you'll remember some bad stuff, but I bet if you look for it, you'll see all the areas that God was moving in your life and in the lives of others. God is in control. He is over all things. He is not stopped or afraid of anything going on. He is not caught surprised. He knows what he's doing. We can celebrate that this morning. We're going to start today with a call to worship like we do every other week. And I just want to remind you that a call to worship is something that we read together. Uh, usually it's scripture. 
and it helps us focus in our mind on what we're about to do, which is worship. You know, we take worship very seriously as Christians. That's something that we are called to do. It's as important as prayer. It's as important as living out a godly life. This aspect of worship is so important. And so the call to worship's function is to help us kind of get in the right headspace so that we can put our focus on God for the next couple minutes. Today's call to worship is from the book of Luke, chapters 2, uh, verses 8 through 14. So let's read it together. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news of great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and singing glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. No, the flowing way. Now 
Well, good morning, church. My name is Kendall, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at The Crossing. And I am so glad that you've chosen to tune in this morning. It is Christmas week. Can't believe it's coming up. And so this is our last Sunday to get ready mentally. Physically, I know you got presents to wrap, but get, don't forget to prepare mentally and emotionally and spiritually for the coming of Jesus. Make sure that you take time to celebrate. As long as you're here right now, you might as well be here fully. So be here fully engaged. Let your eyes and your ears be open to whatever it is that God has for you because he's got something. And I'm praying that he's going to reveal that to you as we talk. There's several things I want to make you aware of. First of all, this Thursday is Christmas Eve and it's time for our woohoo, our annual Christmas Eve bonfire. It's our favorite event of the year, 6 p.m. at the Grove. The address is there on screen. Uh, bring a lawn chair. We have chairs, but we want you to be comfy. So bring a lawn chair. There'll be plenty of space to distance. This would be a perfect event to invite a friend or a neighbor or somebody who doesn't really go to church or doesn't have any church home. This is a perfect event. It's, 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 just usually beautiful and it's dark and it's just all Christmas carols and scripture and it's just really a meaningful way to spend Christmas Eve together. So I hope to see you this Thursday at 6 p.m. Secondly, next Sunday, January, no, December 27th is our annual Christmas sabbatical. What that means is we're giving our volunteers, every year we do this one Sunday, we give our volunteers a break and we don't have church, all right? So that we will not be at East Ridge next Sunday. I am going to be here online for just a devotional. I'll do a little Christmas sabbatical or a New Year's uh, kind of devotional. And so if you want to tune in here at 10 a.m. on Facebook or YouTube, I'll be here uh, just saying hi and kind of getting us into the new year. And then we'll start back up again on January 3rd at East Ridge. And of course, we'll be here online as well. Finally, I want to talk about our Christmas offering. Our goal is to raise $15,500, and we are two-thirds of the way there, folks. Okay, so this Sunday is a great one. Let's get over the top. Now, we'll run into January for, for the first couple of Sundays like we usually do, um, but just a gentle reminder, if you, want to get, um, if you want to get a donation credit for giving at the crossing in 2020, uh, your time is running out. And so if you want to make sure that you do that, just go to our secure website site and you can find it there. I want to remind you that our three recipients, first of all, is we gave $1,000 to Eastridge Gobblefest to buy 100 turkeys for Thanksgiving. That was really a fun win. Secondly is Family Matters. They're a, a local nonprofit that works with struggling kids to provide counseling and tutoring and educational support. Our goal is to raise $2,500 to buy some iPads and software for them. And then finally, we're trying to raise 12,000 to go to Cornerstone Academy. And that's a, uh, a, an academy in rural Haiti we've had a meaningful relationship with for well over 10 years now. And we are in the process of rebuilding their child sponsorship program. And so right now we're trying to keep them operational. So we need about $12,000 to make that happen. A thousand of that is going to Cornerstone Church so they can put on two community meals. They cook up this big pot of rice and beans and everybody comes. It's really cool. I've had the privilege of being there a few times. So I want to just tell you, thank you. Thank you for being part of what Jesus is doing in us and through us and being part of, of building his kingdom together. Thank you for giving to the crossing so that we can do stuff like this. It's pretty cool. If you haven't given before and you'd like to start, you can do it pretty simply. Just follow the link on your screen. It'll take you to our secure site and walk you through the process. It is our habit that whenever we pray for our offering, we always pray for another church in the area. Because how many churches are there in Central Florida? One. It's the Church of Jesus. We want to see His church flourish everywhere. So the Church of the Week is New Life Presbyterian. It's up in Mineola, just off of Highway 27. The pastor's name is John Bopp. So we're going to pray for them, pray for our offering, and then we're going to jump in to our final Sunday of a messed up Christmas. So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for your presence with us and that you are for us and with us. And through Christ, you can be in us. And Lord, that's possible because you came at Christmas. And so I pray that this week, as you make final Christmas preparations, that you will let us really focus in on you and, and truly celebrate your coming to earth. Let, our, let, us, let us lift our eyes to you in the midst of all the busyness and just stop 
and remember what you have done for us. Lord, I want to thank you for the privilege that we have of being part of your kingdom and giving to it. And, and so as we give you our gifts this week and next, we, we give not because we have to, but because we want to. We really want to be part of what you're doing. We thank you for the privilege that we have of being involved in Haiti and here in South Lake County and other places all around the world. And so we give with great joy and we trust that you will use it to make a difference. Father, we want to pray for New Life Presbyterian Church and Pastor John Bopp today. We ask that you will bless them as they're meeting right about now, that you'll bring them everything they need to flourish, to make you famous, to shine your light, and that, they will, that you will use them to help people know who you are. Jesus, thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, just before we get into the message, it is the fourth and final Sunday of Advent. And in case you've missed the last couple of weeks, Advent is simply the four Sundays before Christmas. It's a time when we intentionally stop and remember what it is that Jesus came to do. And to, and to help us, we have this Advent wreath. And each wet week, we light a different candle, and it reminds us of a different facet, a different aspect of what it is that Jesus came to do. So I want to start by reading Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. You've probably heard this. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The first candle reminds us of God's promise to send us Jesus. The second candle reminds us of the word hope. It reminds us that Jesus brings us hope when there seems to be none. The third candle stands for peace reminds us that Jesus is the source of true peace. And why do we light the fourth candle? The fourth candle reminds us that Jesus came to bring us joy. The joy of knowing God, the joy of worshiping Him together, the joy of experiencing His never-ending love for us. And so we're going to light the final pink candle. Let it remind us. Of joy. Luke 2, which we read just a minute ago as a call to worship, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Here's the prayer of joy. God, you are the most joy-filled being in the universe, and you offer your joy to us. We celebrate that gift, and through Jesus, we accept it. Fill us with your joyful presence and teach us to live in your joy, regardless of our circumstances. Amen. Well, back on October 3rd, Houston's Channel 2 ran this story. Thousands of strangers have pitched in to throw a three-year-old girl a new birthday party days after cell phone video recorded two neighbors ruining the first one. I managed to snag a piece of that video, so here it is. It'll just play. You can see what they did. They basically busted in and busted it up. Sony Berea, the mother of birthday girl Angeli, told Channel 2 that it was a disagreement that quickly escalated. They started breaking tables, chairs, everything. The good news is that a GoFundMe page was started and they raised over five thousand dollars to give Angeli another party. It must have been some, what a great par birthday party, five grand, which took place last October 10th. So we're in this series called A Messed Up Christmas for a Messed Up Year, and it's about the fact that, that from our point of view, the way we see things, nothing about that first Christmas went the way that it should have. Today we're going to finish with Jesus' messed up birthday. I want to take you to Luke chapter 2, verse 1. We're just going to dive in here. It says, At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus 
decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. I want to stop right here for a moment. Luke said, at that time, the Roman emperor. So I got a question, at what time? Well, okay, so at the time that Jesus was born, the Roman Empire's calendar was based on the Emperor Augustus' birthday. They even named a month after, after him, the month of December. Ha ha, no, the month of August. So, but Luke doesn't say in the 19th year of Caesar Augustus. He says, at that time. And the time that he's referring to comes to us from chapter 1, in, in which the angel gives Mary the news that she's going to be mother to the Messiah. That is to say, the way we mark time is not at all the way that God marks time. Caesar Augustus may be the most powerful person on the planet, and the entire Roman Empire may keep time based on his birthday. But Augustus is not at all in the center. God is. God is in the center. Augustus, Caesar Augustus, is just part of God's plan. God is using him to carry out his plan. And this is great news for us because it reminds us that God is very much in control and that he can and will and does use whomever he wants to, whoever he chooses to fulfill his his purposes. And I think this really speaks directly to the political unrest and the division and the polarization we've been experiencing in 2020. You know, we, we tend to get caught up in all these things and we, and we get worried about, about specific outcomes. It has to happen this way or, or life as we know it is going to end. But you know what? Here's the thing. God is not worried, not even a smidge. He's really not worried about it because he runs the clock. He's in charge. All right, back to verse 1. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, here in verse 2, we run into a little bit of a snag because here's the thing. Quirinius was the governor between 6 and 12 A.D. And during his reign, during his time as governor, there's, there's only one record of a census, which was somewhere around 6 A.D., so far, so good. But remember Herod, the nasty king from last week's story who tried to kill the baby Jesus? Well, we know that Herod the Great died in 4 BC. So that means that Jesus was born in 4 BC or earlier. But Quirinius doesn't take his census until at least 10 years later. So well, what do we do with that? Is the Bible wrong? Well, as always... The place to start is always to remember that Scripture was written for us, but Scripture was not written to us. So when we come across something that, that isn't immediately clear, rather than, than concluding immediately that Scripture is just wrong, the place we need to start is, okay, there's something here that we don't fully understand. There's something going on that, that we must not recognize. Now, what we do know is that Luke was a meticulous historian. In both of his books, Luke and then the book of Acts, Luke, Luke wrote both of those books. In both books, he frequently references historical, known historical persons and events and locations and geography, and he ties the story of Jesus to verifiable history. Luke is not just making things up. Okay, well then, so how do we reconcile this difference? Well, here's one explanation that I find rather convincing. The census that Quirinius took in 6 AD was for the purpose, of course, of taxation. <laughs> and as expected, some of the Jews revolted. Okay, there was a little mini rebellion that went on during that 6 AD census. Okay, and, and it was a big deal. So now Luke is writing his book about Jesus somewhere around 60 AD. So he's looking back on something that happened 50 some years ago. So when he says the word Quirinius and census, everybody thinks, oh, I know what he's talking about. It's talking about the one where they had the rebellion in 6 AD, although they didn't say 6 AD, of course. But you know, the one where Quirinius and the census and the rebellion, it was a big deal. So Luke, the historian, clarifies. Now, the Greek word first can also mean before or prior to, as in, 
This was the census taken before Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Okay, so he's clarifying. He's saying it wasn't the census that was taken while Quirinius was governor. This is one that was taken before that time. Luke, the historian, is putting it in its proper historical context, and he doesn't want anybody to get confused. Now, I already know that I lost some of you a moment ago when I said that Jesus was born in 4 BC. Because, okay, wait a minute, doesn't BC mean before Christ? Okay, so, all right, first of all, BC and AD, those terms are not in the Bible. Uh, that was a monk in the 500s who made his best guess, and now we all live by his calendar. <laughs> talk, talk about power. Okay, so here's, here's a little rabbit trail for you. BC does mean before Christ, but AD, contrary to popular belief, AD does not mean after death. It means anno domini, which is a Latin, which is a Latin phrase for in the year of our Lord. All right? So there you go. Back to Luke chapter 2. Let's go to verse 3. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go from Bethlehem to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. So here's where we see Jesus' birthday start to go wrong. Okay, first of all, Mary and Joseph are not at home in Nazareth. They're in Bethlehem. They're 90 miles away from home. Not your house, not your bed, not your friends, maybe not your family, certainly not familiar surroundings. That's a terrible time and place to have a baby, right? Do you know that you can really give birth in style these days? I'm not really up on those things lately, but, but for example, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City you can rent a three-bedroom, two-bath Klingenstein Pavilion. Okay, it's got a name, and you can see that it looks pretty nice. It offers spa-inspired bathroom, bathrooms with Italian glass tiles, and the room overlooks Central Park. <laughs> Other amenities include concierge food service 24 hours a day for two, and you can get vegan and vegetarian options, of course a hairstylist, a manicure, a pedicure, a personal assistant, and all for the low, low price of $4,000 a day, which, of course, that's on top of all the other things you normally pay for, like a doctor, for example, or medications or supplies or anything else. This is just four grand, just for the room. Now, if that's a little bit over the top of your budget, you can get the two-room, one-bathroom suite for only $2,900 a day. So Mary was definitely not at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Which brings us to the second thing that goes wrong in Jesus' birthday. There's no lodging. There's no lodging? Are you kidding me? I mean, God has been planning this for what, what, 3,000 years? And there's no, there's no room? What, what kind of plan is that? Does not seem like it works. Well, have you ever noticed that God's plans rarely line up with our expectations? And when things go wrong, we're pretty quick to complain. God, where are you? God, it wasn't supposed to go this way. It worked out nicely for so-and-so. How come it's not working out for me? How could you let this happen? So let's call that what it is. Really, it's, God, I want you to work my plan, not yours. Ouch. To which God replies, not by turning us into crispy critters with a bolt of lightning, but simply by reminding us, hey, it's my plan. It's my plan. I'm running the clock. I am working. So rest and be and trust. You know, I love how Jesus puts it in Luke 12 verse 25 he says can all your worries add a single moment to your life 
And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, I love that. That's like my favorite phrase in the Bible, okay? It's a very tiny thing to add a moment to your life. If all your worries can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over big, bigger things? Jesus said, rest, be, trust. Stop trying to force the outcome to be the way you want it. And by the way, let me clarify a piece of the Christmas story here. Mary and Joseph... We're almost certainly not staying alone in a stable behind an inn. The, the word here that Luke uses for lodging, it means spare room or, or guest room. And as a matter of fact, Luke uses the actual word for commercial inn, like a hotel, motel kind of thing. He uses that word later in the story of the Good Samaritan, but he doesn't use that word here. Now, there's several reasons that I say that Mary and Joseph were most likely not alone and, and they were not in a stable behind it. First of all, hospitality is and was huge in the Middle East. Being, in hospita hosp being inhospitable was one of the worst offenses that you could possibly commit. Ancient Jews often took in fellow Jews that, that they didn't even know. Okay, secondly, Bethlehem is Joseph's ancestral home. Now, we don't know how recently his family had lived there, but we, he, he had to have some kind of relatives, even distant relatives, who still lived in Bethlehem. And they definitely would have taken Joseph and Mary in. So, so Jesus was likely born surrounded by some, some kind of family. Joseph and Mary were not alone. And here's a third thing that, that's really interesting. Jewish homes of this period would build like this. I found an illustration online. Okay, they typically had a, a couple of bedrooms. There was an add-on for guests. That's in uh, num number one there. I think I got it. Woohoo! Uh, number one in the diagram, that's kind of the guest room or the, or the spare room. Uh, then there was an upper room or a loft where the family stayed. That'd be number two on that diagram. And then the main floor down below, that served as a, as a gathering place, an eating space for the family. But at night, the family's animals, typically sheep, were brought into the main room, hence the presence of the manger, which is number three on that diagram. Which brings me to the third thing that's wrong with Jesus' birth. The manger. Really? A manger? I mean, let's think about this. A manger is a feeding trough where cows or sheep or donkeys eat and poop. I mean, that's what happens at a manger. Certainly it was cozy and warm and safe, but oh my goodness, hardly befitting the king who is at that very moment fulfilling thousands of years of prophecy and has come to save the world. Why a manger? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 8, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a few years before Jesus was born, the Romans recalibrated their calendar to match Caesar Augustus' birthday. And, and there were towns that made proclamations to this effect. And here's one of them. This is from something called the Prian calendar. This is what, what it said. Providence has set our lives in most perfect order by giving us Augustus sending him as a savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. The birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of the good news for the world. Now watch this. That word good news that was just talked about and Augustus being God, that is the same word, the same Greek word that the angels use. That's the same word that we call the gospel. So, so just a few years before Jesus is born, the Romans proclaim about Augustus, good news, 
gospel. The Savior is here for us and for our descendants. And then a few years later, when Jesus is born, the angel says, good news, gospel. The Savior is here. But this one is not like Augustus. Okay, Jesus is not just a Savior. He is the Messiah, the Lord, who will bring true and lasting peace. He is the one who will one day end all wars and he will wipe all tears away and heal all diseases and he will bring us the life that we long for. This is the beginning of the good news for the world. Augustus will die. This one will rise from the dead. Augustus is merely human. This one is both human and God. Augustus' reign will end, and it did. This one's reign will never end. Augustus brought peace, Pax Romana, that lasted for 200 years. Not bad, but this one, Jesus, he brings peace that will last forever. This really is good news. It's the real deal. And how does this forever king enter the world? With trumpets and fanfare and power and glory? Does he appear to the religious leaders and the social influencers and the powerful and the political, intellectual elite? Nope. <laughs> he shows up in a manger in an overcrowded lower class home surrounded by animals, relatives, shepherds. And that becomes a hallmark of Jesus' life and ministry. That just becomes a sign of things to come because Jesus came for the powerless. Jesus came for the overlooked. Jesus came for the outcast and the broken and the rejected and the sinners. He came for those who had no hope and no place and no standing. He came as the servant king to serve rather than to be served. And he very purposefully, very intentionally came to earth in a small village. He was born to poor parents. He started his life in a feeding trough because it reflects his heart. <laughs> because he is so good. Verse 13, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. These last, I love these last couple paragraphs in the Christmas story because they're just filled and overflowing with wonder, right? And all these adjectives, suddenly a vast host of angels, the sky lights up, the air fills with song. Peace has come to earth. Shepherds are running to Bethlehem to see Jesus. Everyone, it says, is astonished. The shepherds are in awe and they're amazed that it happened just as the angel told them that it would. This is the first of many times that Luke uses the word astonished or amazed. For Jesus, 11 more times in his gospel, his story of Jesus, he talks about how people were amazed. People were astonished wherever Jesus went. Everywhere Jesus went, people were left shaking their heads in wonder at Jesus and his miracles and his teaching and his authority and, and just his presence. They were astonished and amazed. When's the last time you allowed yourself to be amazed by God's overwhelming goodness? 
and His never-ending love and His unconditional forgiveness, all given to us through Jesus. Be astonished. Be amazed that God loves us so much that when we couldn't go to Him, He came to us as a baby in a feeding trough, in a noisy room full of animals and shepherds and relatives, none of whom were rich or powerful or elite, which is exactly the way God planned it. From the very beginning, God made it clear that wealth and power and status play no role whatsoever in bringing us to Him and making us right with Him. It is only our trust in Jesus. It is only our faith in His death for us on the cross and His resurrection from the dead. That's what makes us right. So stop right now. Be amazed. Be astonished. Allow your heart to fill with joy at what it is God has done for us. My mom tells me that on my fifth birthday, she told me we were going to have a birthday party with ice cream cones. And I got so excited that, that over the course of the next hour, I proceeded to run through my neighborhood and I invited every single neighborhood kid that I come in contact with to come to my house for free ice cream. The only problem is, of course, my mom had not planned on feeding the entire neighborhood. <laughs> but when the kids start showing up, what choice did she have? I found a picture. Here's me and 14 of the neighborhood kids enjoying our cones on the patio stairway. That's me at the tip of the red arrow. <laughs> you know, in my five-year-old mind, it, it never occurred to me that I should ask my mom. I was just so excited about ice cream. I still am. <laughs> I was just excited about my birthday and ice cream cones, and I knew she would have enough for everyone, so I just invited everyone I could. And you know what, I, I, I think, based on the Christmas story, I think that's how God wants us to be with Him. He wants us to, to cultivate a sense of wonder, to be so excited that we invite everyone, expecting that, of course, He will show up when they come. And He does. And He will. He does. Be astonished today. Be amazed this week as you celebrate the birth of Jesus. Worship Jesus, the servant king who began his reign in a manger and seemingly ended it on a cross and then rose from the dead with the power to bring us life. Be astonished and excited and invite the whole neighborhood. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are full of wonder. I thank you that you came to those without power, to those without wealth, to those without status, as you very purposely were born in a small town in a manger as part of your mission to rescue us. And Lord, I thank you that there's nothing we can do to earn your forgiveness, that you did the work for us and that all we have to do is accept it and surrender ourselves to you. Jesus, I pray that this week as we head into Christmas, that you will help us to surrender ourselves to you in a new way. To celebrate Christmas well, just to, to, to stop and be and rest and be astonished and amazed.
Christ. Thank you for coming. We worship you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Christ the King whom shepherds God and angels sing and haste haste to bring him on the Well, thank you so much for joining us here at the Crossing Church. Merry Christmas. It's an amazing time to be worshiping God right now. I just want to remind you that next week at the Eastridge High School is our sabbatical, so we will not be there. We will still be here online through a short message, a short uh, devotional to do with your family. So please join us online next week. Otherwise, we'll see you January 3rd at Eastridge High School. Have a very Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. I cannot wait to see you all in 2021. Bye-bye.